Since the Paleolithic Age, eating meat has been a similarity across some groups of people. But now in the modern world, its climate change has gotten worse, and the terrible treatment of animals has become a core aspect of the American cuisine industry, meat alternatives are on the rise. Before, you would look to veggie burgers, maybe even soy patties. Not anymore. But where did alternatives like Impossible or Beyond Meat come from? Will our consumption of meat actually go down? But most importantly, is it worth it? Welcome to Spoonable Standpoint, the podcast where your hosts, Leo and Charlene, dig into food culture. In this episode, we'll be discussing how meat alternatives will impact our world and the ways that they already have. Are they better for you? What are they made of? How are companies making them taste as close to meat as possible? But first, where do they even come from? The first meat alternative dates back to the year 965 AD in China. I say meat alternative, but it truly was nothing more than a lump of tofu with the same sauce that its meat counterparts would receive. Shi Ji, the magistrate of Qingyang at the time, wanted to promote less consumption of meat in order to emphasize frugality. To promote it, he promoted it as mock lamb chops in order to drive people towards his alternative. Why was this a turning point in world history? Because it marked the beginning of a long journey of finding something that tastes exactly like meat without having to kill any animals so that meat eaters would gladly switch. This tofu alternative was used exclusively up until the 14th century until a Chinese cookbook was published giving a recipe of mock lung sausage and eel. What was interesting was that the primary ingredient was wheat gluten, which is still used today in meat alternatives. But it wasn't until 1852 that meat alternatives were introduced to Europe. This happened because of the creation of the vegetable sausage. From here on out, the Western world would start to shift from the tofu or wheat gluten meat alternatives to new innovations that suited their cuisine. One of the new, and one of the strangest innovations, came during the Industrial Revolution by none other than John Harvey Kellogg. He was one of the pioneers of the breakfast cereal, who we talked about in our previous episode. The alternative was called nuttos, which was made mostly from peanuts. In this case, it was made to taste like cold roast mutton. But more importantly, Kellogg believed that you could get the same amount of nutrients from nuts than from meat, which was his health explanation for eating cereal rather than a large breakfast as we talked about in our last episode. As the popularity of new meat alternatives swept Europe in the 19th century, Many people looked at the same thing that all meat alternative pioneers looked for. Make the meat alternative seem as appealing as real meat. In France, cold cuts like turkey slices or ham slices were released in the early 1900s. They were completely made of soy. Later on in 1929, a baking powder was created that, although tasting like bacon, contained only plant matter. The concern arising from making these kinds of meat replacements is that it leaves an extremely important question. Does it give the same satisfaction as eating meat? And does it taste like meat? To answer that, a new kind of meat alternative was created. One that was just as delicious as a burger patty, but wasn't actually meant to taste the same. In 1982, Gregory Sams, an English restaurateur, created the Veg Burger, or the Veggie Burger in America, which was first sold by his company, Harmony Foods. This kind of burger created a new age of meat alternatives, not because of its originality, since patties made of vegetables was not necessarily new, but because of its accessibility. Since anyone could buy and heat up a patty, vegetarianism and veganism were able to become much more popular. Before, they were considered hippie, especially in meat-loving America. So the popularity of something so anti-meat meant that more innovations were soon to come. In the early 2000s, the golden age of veggie burgers, fast food chains started to introduce them on their menus, starting with Burger King. And recently, new meat alternatives like the Beyond and Impossible burgers have swept the nation, not only because of vegan diets, but because they created products that were supposed to look, taste, and smell exactly like good old-fashioned meat. The goal, though, like goals in the past, is to give meat eaters a meaty experience without having to use meat that is harmful for the environment. What makes them different is that the burgers are supposed to taste exactly like meat, which is not what many other meat alternatives were trying to be. But a question on all of our minds is whether or not it's actually worth it.
In my opinion, the way alternative meats like Impossible Burger or Beyond Burger, how they are right now, I don't think it's necessarily worth it to eat that over beef or any other kind of meat just because it doesn't really taste the same. It doesn't give that same satisfaction, at, at least for me. I haven't had an Impossible Burger, but I have had a Beyond Burger before. And I remember like, when I first opened the package to make it, it was just like bad smell. And it smelled exactly like it was made out of like, beets, pea protein, and mung bean, which altogether <laughs> like, is not the best smell. So it's like right off the bat, I was like, I did not want to eat it. And as I was cooking it, that smell just got worse and worse and worse. It looked like a burger, which is weird. As I was cooking, it was browning like a burger. It looked juicy like a burger, but just that smell really threw me off. And especially even after I put like, I think like chipotle mayo on it and a bunch of cheese. As I held it up to my face, it was just like, the smell got worse. I was about to take a bite. The taste hit me. It was. It's very similar taste to how it smells, and and, and I wasn't really into it. Um, I would much rather have had, like, a regular beef burger. So to me, as it is right now, it's not worth it, just because I get a different satisfaction from beef than from whatever is in the Beyond or Impossible burgers. But I think in the future it could get better, just because like it tastes different. I can see how people think it tastes like meat because it did taste, it had like hints of like meat. And I think that's what threw me off the most because so my body was like, why does this taste subtly like meat? But you know, for a fact, it's made out of 100% plant protein. I do think that that would also throw me off too because it's so similar yet you know it's really different. However, it is important to note that they do have pretty different ingredients and thus would probably have different tastes. Though both of them are made to be very close to meat and probably market toward a meat eater instead of like a vegetarian or a vegan, Beyond Burgers are definitely, in my opinion, based on the ingredients, less like meat than the Impossible Burger. The Impossible Burger uses this ingredient called heme, which is found in hemoglobin, which is basically what makes meat taste like meat. It gives it the metallic flavor and the red color that is just basically distinct of actual meat. What they do is that they genetically modified soybean and yeast in order to produce heme and add it into their burgers, which makes it taste more like real meat, bleed more like real meat, more than the Beyond Burger, I would say, in my opinion. Because they use ingredients, like you mentioned before, beets, pea protein, mung bean, plant oils, and even pomegranate. But though the Impossible Burger might taste more accurate to meat, I've seen a lot of opinions from actual meat eaters saying that meat, like real meat, is just better. So, although for some people, especially the more heavy meat eaters, it's not worth it, it's also important to realize the environmental impact of farming and producing live agriculture, especially cows. Yeah, especially because like the meat production industry causes a lot of pollution. And I think that's what's really great about eating a Beyond or an Impossible Burger, and that it's kind of exciting that we have things like that now because just being able to have a product that can taste similar to something that or that a lot of people like yet it doesn't have the same negative impact on the environment and especially if we have an alternative that we can eat now and that does taste similar to it personally i don't know about you but personally i think that in a few years these kind of products will get to a point where it will taste so close to meat that if they were side by side, you could probably tell which was which. But if nobody told you that it was not meat, like you would eat it, it wouldn't taste any different and it would give you that same satisfaction. I know that now companies like Burger King that have Impossible Burgers claim that it tastes, you know, tastes exactly the same and that they're kind of at that point now. But I've had it, and it they have Impossible Burgers, but 
even those, I, I'm sure, have a <laughs> maybe not the same smell as the Beyond Burger, but they have a very different smell, a very different taste, just because it's the second version they released, but it's not 100% meat tasting. And I think a lot of people are actually really unaware of the impact that meat production has in the environment. With cow and beef production taking up so many resources, to raise cattle, you need lots of land, water, food, and all that really adds up. For example, 80 to 90% of the water consumption in the U.S. actually goes to agriculture and a large part of it goes to live cattle. Cows themselves are an incredibly invasive species and also produce heavy amounts of methane when they burp, which at times is even more harmful than carbon dioxide. So the environmental impact is often overlooked, but is something that I think would definitely urge people to make that sort of shift upon realization. So that's where I think meat alternatives have a place. Meat alternatives are getting closer and closer to actual meat, like you were saying. And since their recent developments, I think a lot there's a lot of room and a lot of opportunity for growth and change and improvement. So for some flexitarians or just people open-minded and looking to try new things, things like the Impossible Burger might just be what changes their mind and what opens them to a world of, say, vegetarianism. Probably about 80% of the stuff that I eat is meat, which probably isn't that good for me, definitely not for the environment, but that's just how I was raised and how I continue to cook and eat and all that kind of stuff. But... I think within a decade or so, if I'm persuaded enough, <laughs> which I am beginning to be, I could start to eat Impossible Burgers or Beyond Burgers just as frequently and go towards vegetarianism, especially if being a meat eater is super harmful to the environment. I think the bigger question that we have to ask is whether or not vegetarianism or veganism will be something that takes over American culture as we become a more green country and as climate change gets worse and as the meat alternatives get better and better. Personally, I think that could happen within the next few decades if we're able to <laughs> reduce our, our carbon footprint. But then again, there are people who really love their meat. It is very hard to change, but I, I could see a big shift towards vegetarianism. I myself actually went vegan for a few months just to try it out and just to see what the diet and lifestyle is like. What I eventually found was that other than the actual fruits and vegetables that are truly vegan, a lot of the vegan alternatives like vegan cheese, vegan meat, vegan foods in general that are supposed to replace non-vegan things are a lot unhealthier than the non-vegan counterpart. This is because they add a lot more fats and sugars a lot of the time to make it taste better. And that in turn raises a concern for these meat alternatives regarding their nutritional value. I know that Impossible Meat has around the same amount of nutrients, but is higher in fiber, but a little lower in protein than actual meat. While I don't think the, the, the nutritional value is going to be something, the turning point in many people's opinions, there still is a concern, but not really as great as the taste, which is actually a lot of these companies' first priority. I agree. The main part is that it's healthier for the environment. I think it will be better if there was some way to make it taste like meat without it being as bad as meat. But it is slightly better, but it does have high sodium content. Just going by first instinct, it doesn't seem as bad for you, just because it's made of plant matter. Which I think, just going by that, persuades people to look into it, or discourages them, because it could never be as good as meat. All things considered, I think we already are in the future of meat alternatives as they're actively being developed and popularized, so development in this field 
I think, is expected to grow exponentially, thus improving shortcomings like nutritional value and closeness in terms of flavor to meat. I think this is definitely a promising industry that is working to reduce something that has an immense impact on our immediate future. Meat alternatives are an incredible food product that has implications that can change the way food production operates. As climate change gets worse, the need for less carbon emissions greatens. If it means switching away from meat, something entirely plant-based, it could be worth it in a few years if it isn't already now. Who knows what the next few years can hold? Perhaps soon we will have a product that tastes so similar to meat, no super taster could tell the difference. But first, we need to convince the meat eaters. Also, be sure to check out What's On Your Mind, a weekly podcast by Anaya to hear about the incredible journeys of powerful women about how they got to where they are today. One Small Business is featured every week, so be sure to tune in. We're sure you'll love it as much as we do. Thank you for tuning in on this week's episode of Spoonable Standpoint. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Spoonable underscore Standpoint for latest updates, link to our website, and other bonus content. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share. We release a new episode every other Friday, and we hope to see you there.